Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman. Informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman here, and thank you so much for joining us. This is, of course, Insurance Hour, and I am your host. We are here to try and help you out with your insurance questions and answers and help you be educated in general on how insurance works, especially how things are working these days because things are changing. Phone lines are open. You can reach me at 559-656-0317 or you can send your questions into questions at insurancehour.com. If you miss any part of the show, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it pretty much everywhere. iHeartRadio, Amazon Alexa. Sorry, I said that. Hopefully it's not activating everybody's system. So let's just jump right in because we've got a lot to cover today. With everything going on in the world of insurance and regulations and things that are going to be impacting what we pay, how we pay, and what carriers we're willing, uh, we're able to pay, I thought I would take a step back for California's sake and talk a little bit about current regulations and the genesis of Proposition 103. So let's, let's start from the beginning and go back and see how we got where we are today with Proposition 103, what it was designed to do, what it's doing, and everything else in between. So let's first, we need to go back to the genesis, to the beginning. So we're in the 80s, right? We're in the early 80s, and originally we're talking about the time when MTV and music videos were all the rage. Uh, personal computers were just starting to become a thing. We had the Apple IIe, Apple IIc. We had the Commodore 64. We had uh, some video games that we were able to play as well at home. It was a different time, right? Fashion were looking a little different than they are today as well. We're talking shoulder pads, neon colors, uh, leg warmers. I know, maybe I'm feeling a little nostalgic now. But you, if you were around then, you would know it was a very different look and a different feel. Michael Jackson, Madonna basically were dominating the airwaves. I remember actually on MTV with Michael Jackson, they used to air Thriller every hour on the hour. So if you wanted to watch that video, then you would have to stand by and watch it at that point. TV shows like The A-Team, Miami Vice, Cheers, that was uh, that was all the rage. And as far as the economy was going, and, and in general, regulations, we had what were called Reaganomics that were coming into play. So we had President Reagan, who was elected for two terms, a little bit of history if you're curious. He was actually the governor in California as a Democrat and then ended up running as a Republican president. Who knew, right? So Reaganomics was big, and Reaganomics had a lot to do with cutting taxes, deregulation, increasing military spending. It was a very, um, how do I put this, very specific tenants that they went by. Uh, they were famous for... Uh, getting rid of the unions for air traffic controllers and basically firing a lot of them to, to help out with the deregulation. Um, mental hospitals that were state funded, a lot of uh, that were federally funded were, were cut back. And again, we, there was a lot of focus on privatization and military spending. In addition to that, we had lots of fears from the Cold War, right? This was our, our, our big enemy, Russia, and the fears of nuclear weapons and total annihilation. I think that was when the movie came out, Day After Tomorrow, and it was one of the scary ones showing about what happens when there's a nuclear bomb, which only Hollywood could come up with a way to show you what happens in a matter of seconds and make it last an hour and a half long movie, right? Technology-wise, we had things like the VCR first coming out, cable TV. These were new things. Music, again, hip-hop, rap, punk, new wave. Health and social-wise, there was the AIDS epidemic, of course, and Nancy Reagan's famous war on drugs and the Just Say No, the famous commercial for This Is Your Brain, This Is Your Brain on Drugs, and the guy cracks the egg and it's frying. Very, very classic. If you haven't seen it, check it out on YouTube. Uh, there was a lot of distrust with regard to the government at this period of time as well. Uh, after the Watergate issue and the Vietnam War, and then came the Iran-Contra affair, it was not a time when people tended to have a lot of, uh, what's the right way to put this? They were suspect of government, suspect of big government. And I think that's in part why we saw a lot of Reaganomics 
and a lot of popularity for, for Ronald Reagan was because he was the antithesis of not big government. He was all about, let's just deal with defense and let the private industry do what they do best. Lots of deregulation. And finally, uh, we can't forget about this. This was the dawn of the 24-hour news cycle, right? This was the time when people would all would have the ability where we could sit down and watch TV 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. And I'm not so sure that was ever a good thing to start, but we certainly have it now. We have the, we have news available all the time. So keep in mind, I'm bringing these all, all these points up to you because this was the era that Proposition 103 was spawned in. You can sort of get an idea right now. It was a different world, different environment, different economics, different technology, different social attitudes, different everything. Now, back in the late 80s in California, again, uh, insurance premiums were escalating significantly. And specifically, auto insurance premiums were escalating to levels that were never really seen before. There was very little oversight. Again, this was part of all of the deregulation and let the private carriers, let the private companies do what they do. And at the same time, while all of these premiums were increasing, the insurance carriers in general were uh, showing record profits. Now, this is a this is ripe for the picking, right? If the carriers are saying we're making a ton of money and premiums are going up, this is not going to be sustainable. This is not going to be something that's going to last forever because nobody likes that. That is not a good thing, right? So we have high profits for the insurance industry, high premiums for the consumers. Lawmakers were failing time after time to try and pass legislation in Sacramento to try and tackle some of these issues. So there was a lot of public pressure to try and find a way to reel in the insurance industry, make it in a fashion that was more consumer friendly, more consumer protections, and at the same time, maintain a healthy competitive environment for insurance carriers to continue to, continue to compete in. Now, this was what was happening in the late 80s. Now, we're going to see what some other states were dealing with at the same time, because I want you to get an idea of some different avenues that could have gone on back in that time during when Proposition 103 was being pitched and then eventually was put on the ballot. So stick around, because when we come back, we're going to talk about that and what some other states were doing to handle this. I'm Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. In today's uncertain times, navigating the California insurance marketplace can feel like a journey through uncharted waters. That's where Sussman Insurance Agency steps in, guiding you with the wisdom of experience and the care of family. We at Sussman Insurance Agency understand the complexities of finding the right coverage in these challenging times. With decades of expertise and a heritage spanning two generations, we're more than just insurance agents. We are your trusted advisors, your navigators in the sea of insurance options. Treating our clients like family isn't just a phrase, it's our commitment. We listen, we understand, and we provide solutions tailored to your unique needs. Why? Because to us, you're a part of the Sussman family. Family. Don't let the tides of uncertainty sway you. Anchor your trust in Sussman Insurance Agency. Call us today at 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Have specific questions? Drop us an email at sales at sussmaninsurance.com. At Sussman Insurance Agency, we're not just in the business of policies. We're in the business of peace of mind. Sussman Insurance Agency, navigating your insurance life together. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman here. You are tuned into Insurance Hour. Thanks for being here with me. Lots to learn, lots to go over today. Remember, the phones are open, 559-656-0317. You can also send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. If you need immediate insurance help, you can also use pound 250 and ask for an insurance quote. Dial pound 250, just say insurance, say insurance quote. Whatever it is you need, say it. We'll get you to someone that can help. Now, before the break, we were talking about the beginning of Proposition 103, what the environment was like in California. And what I wanted to do now was step back one tiny bit and talk about other states other than California and what they were doing around that time and a little bit later to try and combat the same thing. Because California was not the only state that was dealing with high premiums and high profits from the insurance industry in general. For example, in 1988, uh, New Jersey passed what was called the Auto Insurance Reform Act of 1988. Effectively, it rolled back prices 
lowered prices for insurance premiums and freeze any type of premium increase for a period of time. Discounts for good drivers were also introduced, meaning if you met certain criteria, you had to be classified as a good driver and they had to go based on that and charge specific types of rates and use specific types of underwriting criteria. And finally, there was increased regulation as well. Remember, we're in the 80s when regulation was being frowned on. So these were some other states doing some other things. Much later, uh, in the early 2000s, Massachusetts changed their regulations where the states had to get prior approval in order to file for any type of a rate change. Interestingly enough, Texas has what's called file and use, which basically means they're able to make changes to their policies, immediately enact them, and then send the information on to their state department of insurance. The state department of insurance then has the ability to come back and say, yeah, no, and go back and forth until they come to some uh, form of compromise to be comfortable with. And then the insurance industry has to uh, adjust based on what the department said. New York came out with prior approval ratings again for their Department of Insurance. And Florida also came out with regulations that said that rates needed to be approved. So this was definitely something that was uh, that was ripe for the picking. Because again, when you have high premiums and high profit, that disconnect tends to uh, sow some discontentment. So enter the ballot measure in 1987. It was for the November 8th, 1987 ballot in California. And this is exactly what the ballot measure read. It said, and I'm reading this quote, requires minimum 20% rate reduction from November 8th, 1987 levels for automobile and other property casualty insurance. Freezes all rates from November 8th, 1989 unless insurance company is substantially threatened with insolvency. Thereafter, it requires every insurer offer any eligible person a good driver policy with 20% differential, requires public hearing and approval by elected insurance commissioner for automobile, other property and casualty rate changes, requires auto premiums be determined primarily by driving record, prohibits discrimination, Price fixing, unfair practices by insurance companies. Requires commissioner provide comparative pricing information. Authorizes insurance activities by banks. Summary of legislative analysis estimate of net net state and local impact. This proposition would increase Department of Insurance administrative fees by 10 to $15 million in the first year, varying thereafter with the workload to be paid by additional fees of the insurance industry. State and some local governments would have unknown savings for lower insurance rates. Gross premium tax reduction of approximately $125 million for the first three years, offset by required premium tax adjustment. Thereafter, possible state revenue loss if rate reductions and discounts continue, but gross premium is not adjusted. That's it. That was what was on the ballot. And the average person looks at that and says, cool, they have to reduce my rate. They can't raise my rate. All is good. Another part that's important to be aware of is they, as you know, if you look at the ballot, it also lists fiscal impacts. And and some of them are included in there. And as you can see, it's an increase in administrative fees, a decrease in revenue. And then the breakout for that from the California Legislative Analysis Office said, and again, I'll read the quote, would increase Department of Insurance administrative costs by 10 to $15 million in the first year, varying with the workload, to be paid by additional fees on the insurance industry. So they're going to be increasing spending on the insurance department by 10 to $15 million just in the first year, and that would have to be paid for by the insurance industry. And you can guess how that trickles down to consumers, but we'll move on from here. State and local governments would have unknown savings from lower insurance rates. So no real knowledge, no real um, crystal ball at that point. Gross premium tax reduction of approximately $125 million for the first three years. So they're saying that in the first three years, the state's going to lose about $125 million. Thereafter, state revenue loss if rate reductions continue. So if the bill... if continues to do what it's supposed to do, continued losses for revenue for the state. So if we're looking at this fiscally, 
And we're the state of California, state of California, and this is probably why the legislature back then did not pass anything that did anything along these lines was we're going to increase spending on the government program, the Department of Insurance, and we're going to reduce the amount of revenue that the state is generating. Not usually something that uh, is a political good thing, right? Increase spending and decrease income for the state. Remember, we're talking about the 80s, a time when deregulation, when less government is something that people are really focusing on. So this was definitely an outlier as far as what was being done. Now, what's interesting, as you can imagine, is how this particular proposition was marketed. And what's interesting is, back in the 80s, again, different world, there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. The Fairness Doctrine said that television stations and public media had to provide equal time to both sides of news events. Propositions certainly fell on that. So free of cost, if one potential side of the story has is spending money on advertising and they're spending X number of dollars, by law, the news stations have to give that same amount of time to the other side, the other side of the story, you might look at it, free of charge. So the people that were promoting Proposition 103 were benefiting greatly by the Fairness Doctrine because, as you can imagine, the insurance industry was not happy with this legislation and they were spending a lot of money. The people that were pushing Proposition 103 did not have anywhere near that amount of money and the Fairness Doctrine kicked in and enabled them to get their message across free of charge. Let's find out a little bit about what happens next. We're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we will talk about some of the ramifications of the ballot measure, where it went, and where it's going from here. I'm Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. Thanks so much for being here and learning and getting a little history lesson at the same time. These are important issues, and I hope that you're paying attention. And if you do have questions, you will reach out to me so I can try and address them for you. Phones are open, 559-656-0317, or you can always email later at questions at insurancehour.com. If you've missed any part of the show, be sure that you check on YouTube or check on any of your podcast favorites. You will find Insurance Hour, and you'll have a copy of this there. In the meantime, if you do need immediate help with your insurance, you can simply dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and you will get connected with an agent that can help you right away. Before the break, we were talking about Proposition 103 and the ramifications and how it was billed and how it was sold and how it was advertised. So the way the bill was promoted, if you will, was as a, and I took some of these quotes from headlines that I was able to find. It was sold as a, quote, rate rollback, 20%. It was also known as a fight against the insurance industry greed, and also as, quote, elect the insurance commissioner for accountability. So people are looking at this and they're saying, well, I would like to pay less for my insurance. Who wouldn't? And if this bill, all I have to do is vote yes, and I'm going to get my rate rolled back 20%, and they're not going to be able to charge me a higher premium. Great. And that was under, that was the, that was the marching order, basically. That was what it was all about. That's what the ads were about. That's what the, the talking points were about. It was talking about, again, how there's this greed with insurance carriers and they're making all this money. We're paying all this money. We have to get them more in line. Interestingly enough, again, we're talking about the 80s when 
private industry, private business was at an all time high as far as consumer thinking was, right? And the insurance industry, for better or for worse, wasn't necessarily viewed as a private industry, even though, as we know, it is. As a matter of fact, in California alone, the insurance industry is responsible for over 300,000 jobs. So just to put some perspective on it. Interestingly enough, after all the push and that very obvious who wouldn't want to save money ballot measure, Proposition 103 did pass barely. It passed by a margin of 51%, 51.13 to 48.87. So a very, very close ballot measure indeed. These days it would probably be disputed. I don't believe that it was at that point because back then we simply took the elections and we believed them and moved forward. So Proposition 103 became the law of the land. And let's go over what some of the provisions were in the proposition more specifically. So now we see where we were in time. We see how we got there. We see why we got there. We see how the bill passed. What is this bill going to do? So here are the highlights for you. The purpose was to reform the insurance industry in California. It was going to address the high insurance rates for automobile and property casualty insurance. It was going to address the lack of regulation and oversight of the insurance industry in general. It was also going to tackle unfair rate setting practices that were not based on driving records, which is interesting because you would think auto insurance, you would rate them based on their driving record. Turns out, and we know this you know, in hindsight, that there are many factors that can in- impact someone's propensity to have a car accident or a speeding ticket other than their driving record. But that's for another time. Key provisions, and again, it mandated a 20% premium reduction in insurance rates. It froze premium rates at 1987 levels until November 8th, 1989. And it required public hearings and an insurance commissioner approval for any future rate changes. It also created the establishment of an elected insurance commissioner. Now, this is a big deal because previously the insurance commissioner was appointed by the governor. So, yes, we would basically elect the governor. Hopefully he's the guy we want or the gal we want, and they would appoint the insurance commissioner. Well, Proposition 103 said, no, we don't want that. We want the people to have a direct say in their insurance commissioner. So this created an elected position for the insurance commissioner. Additionally, I'm just going through some of the notes again, and I see all of the highlights for how the bill was sold. Save money on your insurance bills, bring fairness to the insurance rates, hold insurance companies accountable, elect an insurance commissioner to fight for you. And this is it. This was on the final ballot. We know you have those final little summaries. It said, ballot showed, mark A, a yes vote. And you support a minimum of a 20% rate reduction for automobile and other property insurance casualty rates. Vote no if you do not want this. Again, it doesn't surprise me that it actually passed because, again, who's not going to vote for lower premiums in general? Proposition 103 also allowed for what's called interveners. An intervener is an individual or a company or an organization that decides that they're not happy with what the insurance carrier is trying to do at any particular time with one of their filings. They might not like the premium that they're trying to submit. They might not like the underwriting guidelines they might submit. So what they do is they have the ability to act as a pseudo Department of Insurance and insurance commissioner, and they can have what's called a public hearing where they sit down and they'll talk with the insurance carriers and they'll talk with the Department of Insurance. They'll voice their concerns and they'll come up with some type of a resolution before any type of changes can be made. Interesting point that we have a Department of Insurance that does that. The intervener process was an add-on, right? It was there to try and help people feel that much more connected to what's happening in the insurance industry. Because if you're living in an area, you're having trouble getting insurance, or you think that you were wronged in some way, you could go as an individual and stand there and, and pound your fist on the table and say, this is wrong, explain this to me, make this right. In reality, one that ended up, what ended up happening is the people that actually created Proposition 103, since Proposition 103 was enacted, there's been one organization, and that's the organization that created Proposition 103, that's been responsible for 75% of every time there's been an intervention. So Proposition 103 creators created an intervening process, and then 75% of that 
they handled themselves. In the last five years, that number has actually gone up to close to 90%. Now, the cost of intervening, right? If a person, or in this case, the group that created Proposition 103 intervenes on a rate, that's going to cost money, right? It's going to cost the insurance company. They're going to have to pay costs. The Department of Insurance has to pay. They all have to get together, right? All that costs money. Those costs are paid back to the entity or individual, or again, in this case, 90% of the time to this organization. So they get all their money and that premium, the, the charges that they're paying back to them inevitably will get passed down to consumers. Has to go somewhere, right? So I want to talk a little bit more about Proposition 103. Specifically, I want to talk to you about some of the side effects that it had. And then after that, I want to talk to you about some of the changes that have already happened to that law since 1987, because people tend to think that it was perfect and it's never been changed. It's been changed quite a bit. Let's talk about it when we come back. I'm Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. Do you need homeowner's insurance? Has your previous insurance company left the state, non-renewed your policy, or maybe they just raised your premium to an amount that you simply can't afford? Whatever the situation, we can help. Just dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote, and we will connect you with an agent who can assist you right away. Or if you prefer, you can visit us online at insurancehour.com forward slash quotes. Whether you're looking for homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, we'll send the best options straight to you. So what are you waiting for? Simply dial pound 250 and say keyword insurance quote. And we will connect you with a live agent to help provide competitive quotes for your homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. Don't get caught unprepared. Insure what matters with an insurance company you can trust and with a premium that you can afford. Don't put off until tomorrow what you should have done yesterday. Simply dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say keyword insurance quote. We all love children, and many of us have an old car, truck, or van in the driveway. Find the Children has a great way for you to put your unwanted vehicle to good use. Keep listening. Every year, thousands of kids go missing. Trust me, it's a parent's worst nightmare. When a child goes missing, every moment counts, and you need all of the help you can get. Find the Children is a nonprofit organization dedicated to locating missing children and bringing them home safely. You can help support their mission by donating your car, truck, van, or SUV. A towing company will come and pick up your car for free, running or not, and the donation of your car is tax deductible. Your help is providing the funds they need to continue their services. Call now, donate your old vehicle to find the children and get free pickup. Here's the number. 800-403-6517. 800-403-6517. 800-403-6517. That's 800-403-6517. Hello, hello, Carl Sussman, and this is Insurance Hour. Thank you once again for being with us today. We are learning all about Proposition 103 today. If you have specific questions, feel free to call 559-656-0317 or email your question into questions at insurancehour.com. Also, if you do need help with your insurance right away, you can simply dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, get transferred to an agent right away. Now, we've been talking about Proposition 103, and we've been talking about how it came to be, the environment that was going on at that time, and what the law actually said. Now, we assume that when the law is passed that it becomes gospel, and that's just the law, and that's just the way it is. People have actually referred to Proposition 103 as the insurance Bible in California, unchanging and unwavering. I want to dispel that myth and go over some of the major changes that have already occurred to the proposition, starting with the year after it went into effect. But before I do that, there are a few things I want to mention that I want you to be aware of. There's something called precedent, and it's, I believe, a legal term, and I'm not an attorney, a disclaimer there. Precedent has to do with if, you, if one person or if something is done at one point, then if it's done again, you can always look back and say, hey, well, it was done over there, so it must be okay to do it over here. And there were some very interesting precedents that were set with Proposition 103. When they, when the law comes in and tells a private company what they're allowed to charge for something, or in this particular case, forcing them to lower their price by an arbitrary number, it sets a very interesting precedent. 
try and imagine this. Let's say you're shopping for a Toyota and the, you know, the window sticker is, I don't know, 30 grand, 31 grand. But the Department of Transportation in California says, you know what, Toyota, I think we need to make these cars a little more affordable. I want you to knock off 10 grand from the price of the car. Oh, no, you don't have a choice. If you're selling cars in California, you're going to charge 10 grand less, period. It's, it's literally no different than what happened based on Proposition 103, which literally just told the private insurance companies that were licensed to do business in California, you will lower your rate by 20%. Moreover, you will not increase your rate at all for a minimum of two years. So back to Toyota. So the precedent was set at that point that the, the voters of California in this case, I can't say the government because this was legislation that was passed by the voters in California, set this precedent that you can go to a private company and mandate they change their price, literally. Toyota, not 30000 for your car, 20000 And by the way, don't even think of raising that price again for at least two years. How does that work exactly? How, what, are, what are the mechanics of that? How is that financially feasible for, again, we're picking on poor Toyota, for Toyota or for a private insurance company? As you can imagine, it's challenging, to say the least. Now, I don't have any type of inside knowledge to be able to try and explain how the industry in general survived when all of a sudden they had to make these dramatic changes. However, looking back actuarially, I can tell you that once the proposition passed, it did not take long before it was, of course, there were some challenges by the insurance companies. They were saying they need time to make these changes. They were trying to find ways to, I say, extend the runway while they figured out how in the world they were going to take their bottom line, their net net dollars coming in and cut them by 20%. Again, think about that again. Imagine if Apple computer uh, actually, I take it back. They just became Apple Inc. I still think of them as Apple Computers. That was the, actually the corporation's name initially. What if the state decided to say, you know what, Apple? We think everyone needs to get these iPads cheaper. So we want you to charge 20% less. It's not a choice. You will charge 20% less. And by the way, don't think about raising that price for at least two years. Oh, and one other thing. Before you're allowed to raise that price by... 20, we, that price again in two years. We want to look at it to be sure you really need the money, yeah, Apple. Now, we all know that Apple certainly is not uh, in need of funds. So the likelihood is that they probably would be stuck having to charge that lower premium on the iPad indefinitely. Is that fair? Up for debate. Is that legal? Up for debate. Did it happen in 1987 and affect every private insurance company in California, it did. The immediate fallout was many insurance carriers no longer did business in California. So there was an immediate exodus of companies that simply threw up their hands and said, we can't operate in this environment. We don't have a problem with an insurance commissioner. We don't have a problem with fair rates. We don't have a problem with non-discriminatory practices but we literally cannot financially afford to just arbitrarily take 20% off of what we're charging for the next two years and then hope that in two years we can try and, and eke our way back to profitability. They just couldn't, so they left. When those carriers left, of course, we had less competition left, left in California. Some carriers left, some stayed, some smaller companies tried to come in to fill the void, but there was a big shakeup, a big shakedown, if you will, because all of a sudden the environment that the private carriers were working within was under heavy, heavy scrutiny. Not a judgment call, just a fact. One of the other important factors to understand about the insurance industry in California is now that it had an elected insurance commissioner, individuals, residents in California, had the direct ability to put somebody in the insurance commissioner's chair that had full control. This was the individual that had, would have to basically do their bidding. This would be the individual that would sit and have to communicate with the insurance carriers anytime the insurance carrier wanted to make any kind of a change. It would have to go to the Department of Insurance. The Department of Insurance would have to approve it, disapprove it. The timeline for that process was anywhere from months to sometimes years. The reason for that is beyond the scope of this show. Just accept that at face value that both the Department of Insurance as well as insurance carriers will tell you that 
One of the biggest challenges they face is that time period when they're trying to get a change made to a policy and it has to get through the, the red tape and the bureaucracy. Side note, the sustained, ins- the sustainable insurance strategy that our current insurance commissioner, Ricardo Lada, is putting through is going to cut that process way down. And the trailer bill that Governor Newsom is pushing to be signed into law in a matter of days is going to expedite that process even further. So let's take one more quick break, and then I want to talk to you about the insurance commissioner's responsibility, how consumers get that responsibility into the power of one individual. And as importantly, I want to take the next segment and talk to you about changes that have already been made to Proposition 103. Remember, this law was passed when we were wearing padded shoulder pads, and Michael Jackson's thriller was on the radio, and we had our first computers at home. It was a very, very different world than it was than it is currently. So what has happened with Proposition 103 since then to update it? Let's talk about that as soon as we come back from this break. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the magic podcast show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the WindowToTheMagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Carl Sussman, Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here. We are going over a lot of important stuff today. So if you do have questions, feel free to reach out. Call me anytime at 559-656-0317. If you are catching this on, at a later time and you're listening to this on a podcast or on YouTube, remember, you can still call that phone number, leave a message with your question, and I will get to it. You can also email your question to questions at insurancehour.com. If you do need immediate insurance help, you can dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and somebody will be able to jump on and help you right away. Okay, Proposition 103. The tenant being that premiums must be fair but not excessive, adequate but not excessive. And that sounds legitimate. That's not necessarily how things panned out. But what I want to talk about right now, because I keep promising to, is that we're going to talk about all of the changes that have already occurred to Proposition 103. Because you hear about the sustainable insurance strategy, which is what Ricardo Lara is putting forward now to be able to modernize Proposition 103, which gives you the feeling that they haven't made any changes to it. Certainly the people that founded and put the proposition on the ballot would like everyone to think that it is so, so good. It has had no changes. It's had some changes. I'm going to go through them with you right now. Remember the bill passed, the proposition passed in 1987. The initial amendment was in 1988. And it established the criteria for a good driver discount, including licensing and driving safety requirements, basically saying you have to have a valid license, one or less moving violation in three years, and no at-fault accident with bodily injury in three years. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you and I are both drivers, I've never had a ticket or an accident, you have five speeding tickets, and you have three accidents without injury and two accidents with injury, after three years, you and I pay the same rate. That's what it means. It means everybody gets a reset after three years. And because of the provision with fault and not at fault, it also means that if you're involved in an accident and you are only 49% at fault, then there is no there is no premium change that's permitted. Now, I get it. 49% is not your fault. Less than half, right? 
But 49% is pretty darn close to, you know, 50-50, right? It's 1% off. However, that's not something that is, is you're, you're not able to put that into your underwriting or premium checks, which again, has its own ramifications. Additionally, because of this hard reset every three years, some will say that driving records started to become uglier because people thought, hey, if I get a speeding ticket, I can go to traffic school once and it disappears. And if I get another one, who cares? Because three years later, it's gone. They might have accidents. It's okay because in three years, it's gone. So did Prop 103 create driving, driving, excuse me, did Proposition 103 create worse drivers? Well, if you're focusing strictly on their pocketbook, the answer could be yes. The next amendment to Proposition 103 was in 1990, September 24th, 1990, and it provided clarification on the criteria for a good driver discount. It clarified the length of time as a good driver and what a minor violation and a major violation is. Well, I just described that to you. Apparently, it still wasn't clear enough three years after what was going to be considered a good driver and what was not going to be considered a good driver. The next one was going to be, again, in 1990, September the 30th, very soon thereafter. It introduced regulations for timely scheduling and conducting of hearings for rate changes. 15 to 30 days notice for a public hearing. Not a lot of time. Interestingly enough, again, this is the sustainable insurance strategy has that same provision to allow for an intervening process that has stayed exactly the same. We still have that same public overview process. Then we jump to 1992 and they further refine the definition for eligibility for the good driver discount policy. You're seeing a trend here. It seems like they really weren't clear when the bill passed what was going to be considered a good driver which is a little bit scary, but at the same time, not surprising since, as I mentioned earlier on in the show, this was focused on just lowering the rate. The underwriting portions were fairly fuzzy, especially if if you can see in the first three years, it already had four amendments to try and clarify it. The next change came in 1993, October 1st, actually, and this applied procedural aspects to rate change applications and further tightened up how public hearings are going to work. It was designed to streamline that process, which again, we're trying to streamline even more to this day. Another amendment came in 2004, which guess what? It detailed offering good driver discounts yet again and explaining how insurance carriers had to compensate commission to brokers based on good drivers or not. This one makes you a little uncomfortable, right? Because now we're, we're getting involved in how a private company pays compensation to a broker or an agent. That personally rubs me a little bit wrong, but it is what it is. The next one came forward in 2012, and this provided po- um, more information about the public's participation and how they were going to get reimbursed for being involved in these hearings that were go- that were the intervening hearings that were coming into place. This next one is fascinating to me. This was in 2015, and this changed Prop 103 dramatically, and somehow it just slipped under the radar. It introduced a 10-year look-back period for DUIs. 10 years. Remember what we said earlier? Three years, you get a a hard reset of everything. Well, that included a DUI. You could have a DUI once every three years. And after that three year mark, you would get the same low premium as someone that had never had had any form of uh, driving under the influence. Well, somebody finally pushed hard enough and they bumped that to 10 years from three years. Another amendment that happened was in 2018. And again, it clarified some antitrust laws as it was pertaining to insurance. As recent as 2021, there were provisions made to the public's ability to review documents that were provided to the insurance commissioner. That one's a bit highly contested because there are certain things that an insurance company is comfortable showing the insurance commissioner, but doesn't necessarily want to show their competitor. And this legislation that passed in 2021, it was actually uh, effective January 1st, 2022, tightened that up a little bit. And we're still dealing with the ramifications of that as well. And I keep saying laws and bills, they're not. These are all amendments to Prop 103. These are all changes 
to that bill that just said we're going to roll your rate back 20% and give you an insurance commissioner. All of these things were fallout. All of these things were happening decades later to try and clarify what Proposition 103 was going to be doing and, as importantly, what it was not going to be doing. Don't forget, times change. One more quick break, and then I'm going to give you my two cents on Proposition 103, what it's done, what it can do, and what's in store for the future. Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration, and we're here to change your experience. Where others see obstacles, we see opportunities. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we're prepared to leap. Looking under every rock, exploring every avenue, that's not just what we do, it's who we are. Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. We don't just meet expectations, we surpass them. If you're tired of hearing no or it's not possible, it's time to turn to a team that believes in yes and let's make it happen. Don't settle for less. Reach out to Sussman Insurance Agency at 877-411-5200. Visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com or email sales at sussmaninsurance.com. Let's uncover the insurance solutions you deserve. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello. Welcome back. Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here. We've covered a ton of information today on Proposition 103. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, whatever it might be, give me a call, 559-656-0317, or email questions at insurancehour.com. If you need immediate help with your insurance, you can also just dial pound 250, use the keyword insurance, and you're off to the races to get an agent. All right, take a deep breath. So far, what I've given you are facts, not opinions, no slant, no, you know, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm just giving you what has happened, right? And what is happening. Now, I want to take a few minutes and give you a little more perspective, maybe color it in a little bit. And yes, you can say some of this is my opinion, and I'm going to try and tell you that my opinion is based on facts. I'm going to try and provide those for you. So let's start from the beginning. When you hear Proposition 103 and you hear about it to this day, you hear the consumer group, I can't say groups because there's really just one, the consumer group saying that we have saved Californians billions of dollars. Well, Here's my question. To make that claim, we would have to know what would have happened if Proposition 103 did not pass. And unless I'm unaware of a way to get to a parallel universe, I don't know how an organization could claim to know what would have happened if everything was the same except for this particular law being passed. They can't. There's something in medicine where if you taking if they're starting to use a new antibiotic, they're going to give half of the people in the study, the antibiotic, and half a placebo, a sugar pill, and they're going to see what happens. It's called a control group. They don't just give everyone the antibiotic, and if they get better, say, it must be from the antibiotic, right? So anytime you hear anyone saying that Proposition 103 saved X number of dollars, just take a moment to stop and say to yourself, how do you possibly know that? How do we know what would have happened if it hadn't passed? You can say, well, this is what was happening. This was the trend. Fine, that's an argument. But we can't say with any certainty what would have happened. What about the carriers that left California? What about the the lack of underwriting and granularity between drivers and between properties that were not allowed to be put into place? What about the fact that there was less money coming into the industry that perhaps would have enabled them to come out with newer products to differentiate drivers, Drivers that have literally been clean of tickets and accidents for 10 years versus three years. Homes that have different characteristics that make them less likely to burn. There are lots of factors that are not able to be utilized because of Prop 103. So to say that because of it, not only has there been money saved, but to put a dollar amount on it is completely disingenuous and factually impossible to be able to say. They just say it. So please, if you take nothing away from this, take this, take that away. There is no way to know what would have happened unless, again, someone can show me that parallel universe that uh, the consumer group is jumping into and, and comparing and contrasting. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is 
the precedent of coming in, passing a law to a private company and mandating they do something is dangerous. It is a slippery, slippery slope, big time. Now, keep in mind, this is not PG&E. This is not a utility company. It's not the Department of Water and Power. These are private companies. There is no law that says they have to do business in California. They're here voluntarily. Unlike utilities like the DWP, we have to have them, right? They need to be here. The state gives them subsidies. The states give them completely different um, processes for going about pricing and how they do business because they have to be here. We have to have them. We feel sometimes that insurance companies have to be here because we have to have them because private banks, again, we're talking private, won't give you a loan on your house unless you have an insurance policy and can show that their collateral is protected. Well, that's on us as homeowners. If we have a loan and we have to get collateral and they want us to get insurance, that's on us to find. It doesn't mandate a private company to offer us that policy. Interestingly enough, there are people that are saying that if an insurance company is in California, they have to offer coverage everywhere. It's called an insurance mandate. And here's the funny thing. Guess what? We have an insurance mandate. We actually have that right now. If you try to obtain insurance for your home, let's say, and you're not able to get coverage, there's something called the California Fair Plan Association. And guess what? The California Fair Plan will offer you fire coverage come heck or high water. But here's the little known fact. Would you like to know who's paying for the California Fair Plan? Who is actually paying for those claims? I'll give you one guess. And it begins with an I. It's called insurance companies. Insurance companies are paying for the California Fair Plan. If there's a large wildfire today, the California Fair Plan does not have enough money in their coffers from premium alone to pay those claims. <clears throat> they need to go to every admitted insurance company to pay those bills. So we're already forcing the private companies here voluntarily that we need to pay for risks that are extremely high, that no private company wants to take on themselves. So in essence, they pool their money together, mandatory, but they pool their money together with the California Fair Plan to pay for the claims for those areas that are extremely high risk for a wildfire. So we have an insurance mandate. There already exists this entity, this organization to quote unquote, force private industry to take certain risks that they may otherwise not take. I want you to keep in mind as you're listening to the news and as you're going through this process that private companies are just that, they're private companies. If you were a stockholder for a company, for an insurance company, how happy would you be being told that the company you're investing in is forced to do certain things that might make it lose money, that might make it even insolvent? So much to the extent that some companies may choose to leave California and not offer coverage at all, mind you, this is the fifth largest economy on the planet. If an insurance company is leaving California, it's for one reason and one reason only. The environment is such, and I don't mean weather, the, la the laws on the books are such that it can no longer be profitable and maintain offering coverage to California residents. With that, I'm gonna close up. I would love to talk about this more. Please feel free to reach out to me. Give me your thoughts. Give me your comments. We need to be sure that we bring California roaring back with insurance carriers writing business and competing and getting us the coverage that we need. Again, I'm Carl Sussman. You've been listening to Insurance Hour, and I look forward to talking with you again. Everyone stay safe. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 Six five six zero three one seven. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.